tell us a little more about the where does that book fall within this process of us growing as a leader? And and then I, I've got some questions about it. I, I love to ask you. Yeah. So I I, uh, I had a chance to be involved in several different longitudinal studies um, a few years back, and uh, and had a chance to interview a bunch of different leaders across context. And one of the most common challenges when we talk to them about their 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 most impactful developmental moments, they all shared something. Whether they were first level leaders, whether they were an executive with a, a multi billion dollar budget. And it was this um, is when when the conversation started to get personal. We started to study their more specific journey. It was a fundamental tension between uh, staying true to themselves and what I describe as their convictions or their core values, like what's important to them, and communicating that clearly. And at the very same time, connecting with the same information in everybody else. And the, the challenge was that as soon as they moved into a position of leader that they were having to deal with multiple different convictions on the outside, but also figuring out how to stay true to their own direction and path. And, uh, and so it got me really, really interested in that dynamic. Like, why is this the common theme in, in, in how people are, are wrestling with these high pressure kinds of moments in their careers that were super they were developmental, you know, so um, developmentally so important. So I ended up studying that process for years, and I, I actually I didn't find a lot in the leadership lead, literature, to be honest, that 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 sort of looked like what we were seeing. So the place where I, I found the most information was actually in marriage and family systems theory. Oh, I don't know cool. if you're familiar with bond theory. Oh, absolutely. And, and so I dug I I dug deep into that literature in terms of people's emotional processing because we realized that this was the fundamental tension. And what we found in our work was that people had what I describe as a habitual way of responding. They either were were defaulting towards self under pressure, so those pressure moments come, or they were defaulting towards what I describe as peacekeeping in my book. So like truth speaking or peacekeeping was sort of this default tendency and that the, each side got bigger depending upon the person's tendency. So what we did was we're like, okay, we, we're understanding something about this dynamic, this emotional dynamic that's systemic in nature because, you know, if I surround Brandon with a bunch of different people, they're going to, they're going to, uh, cause him to move toward his habit. Like even it's not just him. He's not trying to be emotionally mature in a vacuum. It's like he's trying to do that within the system people that he functions. So what we studied that the first part of the book just sets up those habits and it's all based on one of the assessments in the wild toolkit called the leading under pressure inventory. So we did a bunch of research using that tool The starts. The book starts off with what is your habit, that tendency under the, in those two areas. And then what we wanted to study was what are the strategies that have allowed people to do those two things at the same time? If they're willing to work hard at doing those things, what is it that allows leaders to do that? So the rest of the 11 chapters of the book just break down those strategies that we discovered. And I can tell you, you know, in a moment about the secret sauce. So we've done some research on which strategies are most powerful. We found that they all were important, but there were certain ones that were more impactful than others. And I, you know, every book is anecdotal. I think it's, or it's just autobiographical, I mean. I just, you know, it's something that I wrestle with in my own leadership and, and life is about my own habits. And, uh, and so I think part of it is you're just you're kind of self being a self therapist, trying to figure out how do I show up better under pressure. <laughs> so Fantastic. that's kind of the foundation of the book. <laughs> yeah. So I, I actually would love to get a couple of those nuggets from you about some of those strategies you found to be the most impactful. You mentioned four C's in there too. Tell us about those. Okay, so uh, funny, I just wrote something up on this yesterday that I've never had a chance to uh, to write about. But those four C's are I talk about, you know, what I mentioned those, you know, either move towards self or towards other, and I, we're trying to do both at the same time. Yeah. Whether it's a conversation with your teenager or whether it's you know working with your team, um, and so what I realized in the book is I had to set up a foundation of certain things that need to be in place even before the conversation begins. And so those four things were uh, competence. So certainly my feelings and efficacy around my own comp my own competence or skill affects how I show up when the pressure comes. Yeah. Uh, community of people. If you're not surrounded, it is very difficult to be composed. So if you don't know who's surrounding you, and I don't mean like literally, I mean like, you know, that are around you at a given season of life, uh, the culture that you're in, certain cultures don't, don't actually encourage people to be more mature versions of themselves. And so being aware of that and, and then, um, Culture and character is the last piece that I talk about because even before, like I would say like, the book's not gonna do you much good if you're not willing to edit. And so I'm, I think it takes a character of editability, the word that I made up, you know, someone who's willing to have the backspace key hit on things that even feel like they might be part of their character. Um, and so it's, 
So editability and willingness to change is sort of a key ingredient in all of it. So that's what those four C's that set up that foundation are about. Yeah, that's really cool. So that, so the last one there, that seems like that's either you got it or you don't. I mean, you can't, I don't know if you can coach someone to, to edit? Be, be willing to edit, to be open. Yeah. To well, actually there's some interesting research out there that there are ways to build that even in resistant people, which I'm really fascinated by right now. Um, especially that some of it's coming out of the therapeutic or the psychoanalytic literature yeah. um, that you can. And something I was mentioning before is that the way that you invite people into a process or a moment or a conversation, even the way you ask a question, um, increases editability, increases the possibility that they will actually develop it or develop. I, it's funny, the word develop is fascinating to me because develop means change. And so when we ask a leader to develop, we're asking them to change. Isn't it? And it's like, you yeah. can't, you try to soften that blow and it's not as powerful. It's like, that's really what we're asking people to do. And yeah. who among us doesn't struggle a little bit with that? Yeah, totally. Totally. Because it sounds, develop sounds like, oh, I'm getting better. I'm going to grow. It has a positive spin on change. Yes. It, it doesn't, right. it doesn't exactly. seem to dict, it doesn't, it doesn't um, connote or denote that you're going to lose anything. Abs absolutely. Right? You're like, oh, I'm, not, oh, I'm just getting more. I'm getting more of good yeah. stuff. Like it does. Yeah, whereas, whereas change is not. You think, oh, what am I going to lose? I'm going to lose. Well, something.